my talk is going to be about the latest research that we have done on the structural determinations of genomes and genomic domains. Those of you who follow my talks, you, you see that I use very often that uh, title because this is really what we do. We try to determine the structure of genomes by using the special restraints. Why we want to use the structure of genomes and determine them? Well, despite of what your uh, genome browser might say, which uh, always shows you the data in a linear fashion, the genome is not, is not linear. It has uh, two meters of DNA that has to be packed in a few microns of the nucleus, and that has to be done in a way that is still functional. So for example, and I hope you see my, my pointer here, in that particular scenario, these two regulatory elements uh, might be interacting that gene, while in this other scenario, these two regulatory elements might be interacting that other gene. The amount of genes and the, and the genomic data is exactly the same in both these scenarios, but you can see that uh, the epigenetics uh, uh, and the outcome of these two scenarios might be very different. So we need to understand how these things come together in the space and how they regulate to each other. Many years ago, with my friend Leonid Mirny, we wrote that, that piece of paper where we talk about the resolution gap. And I think it's relevant to bring it back today because what I'm gonna be telling you is what the efforts that we're trying to do to fulfill this resolution gap. And what is this resolution gap? Is, is the things that we do know about the genome in three-dimensional space. So for example, up to, uh, it, thanks to crystallography and NMR, we know that up to the nucleosome packing, we know atomic resolution, a lot of data in 3D about how the DNA is packed, but we don't know that for long pieces of DNA, uh, kilobases or megabases. At the other end of the resolution, thanks to light microscopy mostly, but not uniquely, we do know that chromosome territories exist back then in 2011. So over the years, and thanks to molecular biology technologies, mostly deriving from the chromosome conformation capture that the Decker lab started many years ago. And thanks to light microscopy, we are making this gap smaller. So the resolution gap is getting smaller and smaller. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about our efforts in together with the Wu lab at the Harvard Medical School that we do to bring more information about how the genome falls towards that direction using light microscopy. For many years, we have contributed also in the other end, but today I'm focusing on the end of light microscopy. And this is what uh, I bring you two stories, and this is where I place the two stories. So in that uh, simplified axis, we do have the number of cells that you can study per using microscopy. So normally what we do is we look at many, many, many cells where we look at few loci at the same time. So for example, here, the two copies of these two loci, and the distances between them, and we can do that in a relatively large scale fashion, an automatic fashion, with a large number of cells. But what if we want to target many sites at once? Well, uh, the first uh, one of, sorry, and, and many targets at high resolution, the first story that I'm gonna be telling to you is uh, going to what is called Oligostorm, and we published that last year with the Wula, and I'm gonna tell you what we have done in Oligostorm uh, with them. But another way is also going into large number of cells and large number of targets, which is something that we recently published also with the Wool Lab called Oligophysic. So these are the two stories I'm gonna tell you. Let me, let me give you exactly who did the work. The first is, as, as I mentioned before, is uh, Oligostorm. And Oligostorm, was carried out by Guy, Irene, and Cynthia. Uh, Guy is from the Wu lab, Irene is from our lab, and uh, Cynthia perez is from the Aiden lab. It is Lieberman Aiden lab. So what we tried, the objective here was to develop a technology that would allow us to do what is called chromosome walking using super resolution imaging. So what we're gonna be trying to do here is to take a small piece of the chromosome and figure it out what is the actual shape and walk of this chromosome within the nucleus in a number of cells. Now, this is not high throughput, it's still a limited number of cells, but it works nicely. So how we go for using Oliostorm and getting a high resolution imaging. 
So oligostome is combined with fluidic cycles and we did that into a, one particular cell type called the PGP1 cells. It's a male, so we only have one chromosome X. What you see here is the actual high C data that was provided by a, a Silverman Naden lab. And this high C data, we division uh, this particular region of chromosome 19, which is about eight megabases of DNA. We division it in nine segments, depending in this particular scenario, we wanted to study what is called the segmentation of the genome into compartments. So these are the eight segments. And what the WooLab has been known for for many years is the design of the thing here. What is this? This is what is called the oligos. And the oligos are uh, uh, pieces of nucleotides that basically have been designed and synthesized, uh, designed in the computer and synthesized in the laboratory to have an homologous part of about 30 to 40 base pairs, can be even smaller than that. And that homologous part will need to be homologous to the region of interest, in this case, all this region here. And then they designed the oligos to contain something that they call the main street and the back street. And what are these main street and back street? They are all uh, secondary oligo to go and hybridize in this, uh, either the main street or the back street. So you can use both ends at the same time or for different moments of the cycle. So when they hybridize, it blinks. And then with your oligo storm, you capture those blinkings. Now, how do we do the walking? The first thing that you need to do for the working is to, oh, by the way, this, uh, as I mentioned before, this is done by Guy. And these are the machines that we, they use in the Harvard Medical School. These are a Butara, Brucker Butara microscope, and that's the fluidics attached to it. So the first thing that they do is they send all the oligos at once, and they are designed to hybridize in different parts of this nine work, okay? So these ones here will be specific for the end of the work. And then in one fluidic cycle, they release the secondary oligos for the first segment. It blinks, you capture the image, you wash out, you do the second walk, you capture the image, you wash out, and then you do that until the end, and you wash out. Now you can see that by doing nine cycles or nine steps, we have covered these eight megabases of the region, which corresponds to these segments separated here. Now, one of the steps that is very important when you do these things is that you get as homogeneous distribution as possible of the oligos, and that is done by a software developer at the WooLab, and this is the best that you can do for this particular region of the genome. And it's important to understand that some parts of the genome, you cannot design uniquely the oligos to bind here. So this could be a repetitive regions in the genome, so they would not bind only in the segment number two of chromosome 19, they could bind somewhere else, so you cannot design them. For some other parts, you get uh, an over uh, representation of oligos. So this needs to be as homogeneous as possible, but with a software, uh, that is a possibility that can be done by designing. Now, the other important part of this slide is that you have to understand that we decided that we wanted to do the work in nine segments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine, because we were interested on compartment separation in the genome. Now, if you want to apply the same process, but in your own biological problem, maybe you are interested on two, three topologically associated domains in a region of interest, then you would design the oligos to do the work in three, four steps, one at a time of these topologically associated domains. You can also do a lot of combinations. So you can have one work per TAT or per topologically associating domain. And then the, the fourth walk will be all the TATs at once. So you will see uh, the entire region at once. So it's very versatile in terms of designing the process. Now, let me show you what you capture from the microscope. So you get a lot of images and, and we were not involved in this processing, but then you get all these images with this Butara machine, and then you get the exact XYZ position of each one of the blinkings. And you, what you have here is the actual walk in one of the cells. We did a few hundred cells here. So what is the, uh, around 100 cells, sorry. So what, it, what the walk is, is you, you see it's colored the same way. And we have, this is chromosome 19, tend to be in the center of the nucleus. So in this particular cell, the two chromosomes, the two copies, mom and daddy were close by in the space. 
And you can see the red is the first segment and then the brown, the orange and so on and so forth. And you have the second chromosome here. The blinkies have the same intensity here. I just changed the intensity in the screen for you to differentiate between the two chromosomes. Right away, you can see that the walls have very different path in both copies of chromosome 19 in this particular cell. And I can tell you for the other cells that we looked at, the work is quite different in each one of them. So you can see that there is a, a large amount of variability between the works in between cells and only not between cells, but within cells in the two copies of the chromosome 19. But you can also see that there are certain parts that seems to be intermingling, some, some of the parts that are more dense, something a, a bit at the first sight strange here, which is the, in this particular work, segment eight and nine floating around. That doesn't mean that there is no connection between the eighth, the seventh and the eighth and the ninth. It means that the density of points here was so small that we could not differentiate between noise in the images and actual signal in the images. And this is something that not only us, but many groups in the world are trying to figure it out how to differentiate signal from noise from those images. But these are points, each one of these blinkings is, are points that we can more or less uh, securely say belongs to the blinking of the oligos that we throw in each one of the steps. But you can also see that we can transform this into some sort of densities. And here is where we, uh, my group help the WULAP. So from the WULAP, we get these blinkings. And then we transform those blinkers in something that we call density maps in the same way that you would do for protein X-ray uh, uh, crystallography or cryo-EM. So at the end, we have a density map. And this density map, which corresponds to segment number one in chromosome 19, one copy and the other copy of the same cell that I mentioned before, we can say that they are not homogeneously dense. So for example, this is the most dense part of segment one in both copies. And this is the, se the segmentation that uh, contains most of the blinkings, okay? So what we do first is we transform these blinks, single X, Y, Z positions into density maps. And then we get this type of uh, representation, which is basically the same work done before, but now it's the density of the blinkings. Why we do this transformation of the densities of the blinkings, and this is at 50 nanometers, because now with this information, we can calculate a lot of structural features from each one of the works such as the area that it occupies, the volume that it occupies, whether they are spherical or elongated, whether they overlap to each other. So for example, here, these two seem to overlap a bit, but they are totally separated from the rest. And the distance between them from the center of mass of this density. So we calculated this for a number of cells, and this is for 19 of them and two homologous each. And you can see here the three measures that I mentioned before per segment and the variability between them. In gray, you have the average of all the segments. So let's focus on the area. This is area versus the segment. And you can see that the first, area is uh, the first segment is slightly larger than the second. And then as you go uh, uh, to, towards the final segments, they get smaller and smaller. Now, there is a bit of correlation to the actual size of the segment because they have different genomic amount of DNA per segment but the correlation is not perfect. So in fact, to some extent, they are independent of correlation. They are, the one that you could say correlates quite a bit is the sphericity. So the less DNA, the more is spherical. But you can see here, for example, here, uh, two uh, representative of these measures. The other, the other signal uh, or, or the other uh, important information here is that the variability is large. Okay, so you have variability between segments, but also a lot of variability within segments. So that means that we have a lot of variability of this information, at least in these 19 cells that we used for creating these plots. And nowadays we have about 100 cells. The variability continues to be enlarged. But then with this information, we can also calculate not only the area, volume, and sphericity, but we are also calculating the distance between the center point of each one of these segments to the other segment and the overlap between them, whether they intermingle or overlap a lot these density maps. Um, these plots are a bit, they are very simple to draw, but a bit complex to understand. But what we see here is 
where the distance to segment number one is farther away than expected or closer, closer than expected, given the genomic distance between the two segments. So the, all this data has been normalized to the genomic distance between the, the two segments. So you can see, for example, that this group in the center tend to be closer to, uh, sorry, separated from one and two, but they are closer to three, four, five, and six, and seven, and they are again separated from two, from eight and nine. The intermingling follows a similar trend. They, this, all, all of them seem to intermingle as expectations in, for, chromos, uh, for segment number one, but for segment number two, this middle part here do not intermingle as much as the beginning and the end, and is the opposite for three, four, five, six, and seven, and again, the opposite for eight and nine. So we can start seeing that there are certain features that are repeated in all these number of cells. If you put all of this together into some sort of a, a clustering gel size, we get two large clusters. So what do you have here is each line like this is a segment that we observe in these 19 cells. So in total is 342 segments. So it's one of the rows. And then the columns is these measures I mentioned to you before, either sphericity, density, um, proximity between the segments, et cetera, et cetera. So we cluster everything into groups, and this is the division of the two groups in the principal component analysis. Now, again, this is a division that many people would say is far-fetched, but this is the actual, the best division you can do in this data into two, two clusters in these maps. What do we have in this? So cluster number one here is composed mostly by segments three, four, five, six, and seven. And sometimes in some cells, eight, eight and nine and one and two. But the majority of the cells compose in cluster number one, these segments. While the other cluster, the segments are divided mostly into uh, one and two and eight and nine, and very few times the remaining. So that basically is telling us that we have sort of two separated segmentations here. Now, uh, also interesting is this other plot here. How many times segment number one is classified either a cluster one or cluster two? And you can see that some of them, like three, four, five, six, and seven, are most of the time in cluster number one. Eight, two are most of the time in cluster number two. Then nine is somewhere more often in cluster number two than cluster number one. And one is more often in cluster number one than cluster number two, but you cannot say clearly which cluster they belong to. Now the question is, do this segmentation that we have generated into two clusters corresponds to the known AB compartmentalization in the genome based on high C maps? And indeed that's the case. We wanted to look, we have also RNA-seq, DNA-seq, and a lot of chip marks for the very same cell type, PGP1. So we will ask ourselves of these segments that we divided, what is the average normalized signals for RNA expression? And we see that cluster number one is mostly express, expose, and the signatures of activity, and no signatures or less signatures of repression, while cluster number two is the opposite. So we are also seeing this active versus inactive compartmentalization of the cell. But now the interesting thing about this data, because we could somehow reproduce this by only looking at the high C, you need the images. But now we can also classify each one of the segments and say that, for example, three, four, five, six, and seven are clearly active chromatin state or cluster number one. Eight and two are clearly or very often in B. And then one and nine are somewhere mixed. In some cells, they look like, for the images data, that it could be A or it could be B. Now, we should have done, but we didn't do, RNA expression in each one of these cells, but we didn't have the data. So we cannot tell you in those cells that it looks like B that the genes resident in that particular segment are shut down in that cell. So we don't know this data. But beautifully, we could, we could find the compartmentalization and now per cell, so single cell compartmentalization. 
Another thing that was very interesting from the data is that the area and volume of sphericity, as I mentioned to you, three measures, and distance clustering or overlap clustering gave us also two compartmentalization, but these two maps show you something very interesting in my opinion, that you cannot get only with high C, which is that A and B compartment like to be separated, that we know, because they occupy different compartments in the genome, but A likes to intermingle while B not necessarily likes to intermingle. And this, this would have been green if they intermingle, but they don't. So basically it tells you two things. The first one is that A compartments and A compartments tend to be close, but at the same time, they are so overlap. While B and B compartment tend to be close, but they do not overlap. This is what this data is telling us from the imaging. Now we went one step further and we built three dimensional models of the region because we have the high C from the Lieberman Aiden lab. So we took the high C and then we ran it through our pipeline of TADBIT. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but basically you can transform this into a three dimensional representation of that. Not only one model, but you can generate many, many, many models. And then what you do is you map them into the density map. So we generate these three-dimensional models based on high C, and then we adapt them and see which ones they fit into the density map from the images. And you can see that we get basically some of them that fit quite nicely, some of the models. Some others they don't, some, other, some models fit nicely. If somebody's interested in this binomial distribution, I'll tell you later on what it is. But this is the model that we build based on high C, the best fit without doing anything else than what is called rigid body fitting best fit the density map of one particular cell. But then we can do something that is called flexible fitting. And what we did here is we allow the models to change shape, not totally random. We uh, detected the touch and then we say, okay, touch can move with respect to each other, but the structure of the touch will remain intact. And by doing this, we can actually get fittings that are way better, such as this one here, and increase the correlation of the fitting. This is the cross correlation of the fitting versus the cycle of this uh, flexible fitting. And by doing this, we get better fitting of models. And we did that for the entire work. And this is what you get from the entire work. So now we are working with the models that is the most probable path of the density of each one of these models that confront nicely the high C data and the imaging data from one cell. And we have done that for several cells. So you can see here, each one of these works as, as they go through the path. So why is this useful for? Because now we can start not only figuring it out whether they are active or inactive, but we can start mapping in three dimensional space, all the chromatin marks that we had before. Remember that the original points that we had, we didn't know within the segment which belonged to which part of the genome within the segment. We just had a lot of linkings within the segment. Now with, with the path, we can start marking, for example, in this case, H3K4 monomethylation. And you can see that it correlates very nicely with active compartmentalization. So this is, this is uh, uh, what we could do with oligostorm. We're still analyzing a lot of this data, but just to summarize, Oligostorm is a series of data uh, technologies that allows you to do chromosome walking in the case you want to do chromosome walking. As I mentioned at the very beginning, it's very uh, highly designable. So you can design it for your particular biological problem, except for repetitive regions, where uh, it's very difficult to design these oligos to go specifically there. It will go everywhere, and then you will have a, a Christmas tree instead of an image. It needs to be combined with microfluidics, and in this case, with a super resolution uh, microscope, which is not available for every laboratory, unfortunately. But if you get these images, you can combine it with high C to get, in, the, in our case, models up to 10 kilobytes resolution. Okay, so each one of the points in this tracing that we do in the models is 10 kilobytes resolution. So actually very high resolution data for those works. And as you will see in the next second part of my talk, it can be pipelined with oligophysec to make it faster 
and I'll tell you why it is faster when you pipeline it with oligophysate. So this is the first part of my talk. And now I'm gonna go into the second part of my talk, which is chromosome tracing with oligophysic. This is again an imaging tracing uh, method, but in this case, we have helped not with the modeling itself because the data is, you don't actually need three-dimensional model with IC, but we help here is uh, image analysis. It's the first time in the lab where we enter in the field of image analysis. In fact, this is the first time I give a presentation with a black background because it's image analysis. But anyway, it's, it's image analysis and then the tracing itself, which is not trivial when you have a lot of uh, confusing data. Who did the work? It's uh, a couple of fellows from the Wu lab. That's Huvi and Shemantu. Uh, they did all that you will see, which is designing the oligos and obtaining the images. And then from our lab is David Castillo, who did all the analysis of the images and the tracing and the computational analysis of all the, all the resulting data. Now, what is the trick in oligophysic? Uh, the trick on oligophysic is that you do have oligos as we had before. Remember before we had something called main street and, and back street, but now these main street and back street are a bit more complicated. So they had something called the lead primer set and the lead barcode. I'm not gonna go too much into details. So later on, you will see what they are useful for the seed prime and the seed barcode, and then what is called the heat bridge sites. Because you can design them, you can uh, design them to do a lot of tricks for you. And this is what they did in the Wu lab. So you design these ones that they go into the region of interest. It's not only one, they, they do have thousands of them. In fact, the number of oligos per site is between uh, from uh, covering from tens of kilobases to megabases. You need at least 100 oligos per target, otherwise you would not see the signal, and this is a white field. And at least uh, you need few megabases or a megabase between the targets, so you cannot have targets that are one next to each other, otherwise the signal would be confused, because again, this is white field, it's not super resolution as it's before. That's why you can do it uh, much, much more number of cells. So these uh, uh, oligos, they have, as I mentioned before, the lead side, the seed side, and the hit side. Why are they like this? Because what we're doing here is in situ sequencing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna sequence those oligos in the cell, similar to what you do, for example, in many methods such as MERS, SEC, where you sequence the RNA. Here we sequence again, in this case, the DNA localization, but through the oligos that bind to them. The first one is based on the chemistry, based on ligation-based identification of targets. That's the lead side. So these lead sites allows you to do ligase-based sequencing in, for example, four rounds here, round one, two, three, and four of this particular site of interest, and you have the two copies per cell. That one gives you about 92% uh, detection power. The lead. Then we have also the synthesis based identification of targets, which is based on polymerase synthesis. And it's, uh, it's again four rounds. And this is how it looks like a bit more intensive, but it has 92%, 91% uh, detection power. And finally, the hybridization based identification of targets, which is based on different barcodes and combination of different barcodes, also in four steps it gives you again 92. So we did try these three different chemistries. Well, the Wu lab tried these three different chemistries because not all the labs have access to uh, reagents uh, for doing each one of them. But oligophysic allows you to do all of them uh, as, as is needed in your laboratory. The advantage of doing this sequencing in situ is that now you can go exponential in the number of uh, targets that you can target. Let me show you why that's the case. When you do sequential hybridization, you do one target at a time. So you throw the use oligos, visualize the, 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 the image, the fluorophore, and then you do a second round visualize a second one. So that uh, grows linearly. So the number of targets is the number of fluorophores you have per the number of rounds that you have. Okay, so it grows linearly. But in barcoding sequencing, 
what you do is basically you barcode each one of your sites with four colors. And the order of these colors, one, the first, uh, let's say purple, yellow, blue, or red, give you a lot of power because now the number of targets is F to the end, which means that with four floor fours and n number of rounds, you can do a lot of stuff. What can you do? And this is the plot again for number of targets that you can target. This is a theoretical plot. I'll tell you the limitations later on. But if you have one round because you only have four colors, uh, then you have only four sides that you can color at the same time. If you have two, it's 16 in both cases. But if you have three, you start having differences, 64, 256, 1024. And then in the sixth round, the difference between the sequential and the uh, um, barcoding sequencing is huge. Here you can do a few, uh, a couple of uh, dozens, but here you can do already 4,096 sites that you can localize. In fact, if you were to visualize all the genome, either fly or human at 500 kilobase resolution, so every 500 kilobase, one of these colors, you only need about seven rounds. With seven rounds, you would have enough for the human genome, and about five rounds, you would have enough for the fly genome. So the, the power is huge. Now, the limitations are that this blink, this, this floor force, if it's a uh, um, white field, they get too close, and then it's very difficult to differentiate between them, okay? So you have to design them to be separated enough, unless you go to super resolution, but then you don't gain uh, high throughput, but you gain resolution. So it's a trade-off between the amount of cells you want to visualize and the actual um, sites that you want to visualize. I have to tell you that the team will have, have done up to 126 plex, so 126 sites at the same time per set. So let me show you how it works. And this is a proof of principle. What we did here is six sites per chromosome two, chromosome three, five, 16, 19, and X. So in total is what we call the 36 plex. So there are 36 sites that we're gonna be visualizing. Here we have about uh, 600 kilobases to one megabase per target. 5,000 5, oligos per target. We have done down to 1,000 oligos per target and it still works. I mean, Getting these numbers low down makes, makes the process cheaper. And then uh, it, the, the distance between them was quite high, between seven and 70 megabases between the target. As you can see, we designed them to cover from the beginning of the arm to the end of the arm per, per each one of these six chromosomes, because we wanted to see chromosome conformation in this case, okay? Entire arms chromosome conformation. This is how the actual images look like, and this is what uh, the wool lab sends us when they get this from the microscope, and this is done in, in, a, in a regular white field microscope. This will be a round one, round two, round three, and round four. We did four rounds because we have enough to cover 36 sites with four rounds. And let's imagine that this one here has the oligos design that in the first round they, they are purple, in the second round they are green, in the third round they are green, and in the last round is purple again. So we're looking for a point that blinks in the purple, in the red, in the green, in the green, in the purple. And in fact, of all the composite images here, the only one that does uh, purple, green, green, purple is this one here. So we know that chromosome five, uh, fifth props or fifth uh, group of props is exactly in this position in that cell. And that's how we detect them. We do one by one, no, we get all of them uh, uh, together. This is the composite, put one on top of each other in the, in the lead axis, so that you can see the towers of color. So for example, this side here is the four rounds yellow, and that this side here is yellow, blue, yellow, purple. So we get this type of, of, of uh, data, and then David has to figure it out who is who. And uh, here is where we used an uh, integrative modeling platform as well as some additional software to design per pixel the color in each one of the rounds. So for example, in this corner here, we have all of these colors together, and then we assigned the color per round or the, or the channel per round. 
And then we can see that this particular spot here that changes from channel to channel because not all the channels light in the same intensity, but is clearly purple, red, blue, purple, which corresponds to 2KR2 in our case. Not only that, at the moment we have assigned each one of these pixels their barcode is, then we have to trace the chromosome. And the way we trace it that now we use the interactive modeling platform. It was not as trivial as just tracing it because each one of these uh, pixels has a certain probability to become, to belong to the code. But it, sometimes you, don't, you, you, you are confused between that code or that other code and you can assign those probabilities as well. So you need a bit more complex tracing mapping and that's what we did. And we, this is, for example, the tracing of chromosome two in this particular image. By the way, this is not flat, this is three-dimensional. And these cells are quite flat, actually. So we do stacks in Z, which the resolution, is, it's not as best as in X, Y, as, as it always happens in microscopy, but we also take this into account. So for example, this is the efficiency. What is the efficiency of tracing? It means that for chromosome two, for the majority of the cells, we have most of the barcodes, okay? So we can trace chromosome two and three very nicely, but then for reasons that we still don't understand uh, fully, for some chromosomes, the tracing is not as good. So we cannot assign the barcodes for these six points in all the cells, only in partial number of cells. But we can do thousands of cells, even though some of them, they don't have the entire amount of data, because in two days of image acquisition, you can get a thousand cells. This is one particular white field image. So in this particular one, we have uh, seven cells that we capture or we visualize, which means that with a thousand cells, you have about 5,000 complete chromosomes. And of those, about 150 of them are complete. So all the barcodes are in, in these 150 cells. In the rest, maybe one chromosome misses one barcode or two chromosomes miss, miss another barcode. But then you trace them and you can start calculating, for example, this is cell number one with 97% detection. You can get what we call a distance map. And this is the actual distance in microns uh, of, of each one of these barcodes positions to the rest. And then we can uh, merge all the thousand cells. And in this case, we merged the ones that had at least 90% of, of uh, all the chromosomes covered. So 691 uh, cells, and this is the average distance of all the cells. We can take a high C map and we can calculate the frequency of interactions between this, each one of the props here. We know where they go, so we can calculate this from a high C map. And we had the high C map from Lieberman Aiden lab. Again, this is PGP1 cells. And this is the interactions, and you can see that there is a beautiful correlation between them. Even, even if some of the interesting lines here are repeated, like these ones here. So we are studying why some parts of the genome get hidden from the rest, like, such as, for example, this 2QR2 uh, that is whitish here, and it also whitish there. So we are very much interested on this. Now, another proof that uh, we are placing things correctly in a space is the distribution with respect to the nuclear envelope. We know that large chromosomes tend to be closer to the nuclear envelope than small chromosomes, such as 16 or 19. And this is what we see also here in a total of 1,108 uh, cells. We are also doing a lot of analysis on this data that was not part of the paper. Can we do that in a different way? Again, it's very versatile. You can design it to, for example, cover an entire chromosome. This is 46 sites in chromosome X. We only have one chromosome X. It's a PGP1 hum, uh, human cell line. It's a male. We only have one X, and this is how it looks like. This is uh, the five rounds, and this is the, the composite. And then in this case, we needed five rounds because we had 46 points that we want to cover. And these are the number of oligos we use here and the separation between them. We can still do a beautiful tracing, as I mentioned before. This is one of the uh, tracing for one of the chromosomes in one of the cells. This would be the distance map uh, from zero to three. 
And this is the average distance map in 146 cells where we had all the, all the points. And, and if you look at the interactions now, you can see that more or less there is a beautiful correlation of the interactions versus distances, uh, which is very nice to see that that correlates. Now individual cells can have a very different conformation, each one of them, but the average is really an average. We also um, look at the data on, on, in this case, about 160, 170 uh, cells or nucleus. And we discovered that we had two conformations here. Again, this is only one X, don't confuse that with active and inactive uh, because we only have one X here and in principle it's active. And what you can see here is that we have, in many cells we have this uh, some sort of uh, compact conformation, which is a radius of duration here of that, which correlates to the compactness. And then we had another cluster that seems to have two large blobs. We're still trying to figure out what that means in the fact that you don't have active and inactive in this case. But in a small number of cells, this is the reality and you can separate them very nicely with a, a RMSD classification of the two types. So can you use that beyond uh, chromosome tracing? Yes, as I mentioned to you, if you combine it with oligostorm, which is relatively slow, but you do only one round of a storm, you get this type of images, but that here you don't know each one of these blobs, whether it belongs to one part of the, of, of the genome or another part of the genome. You combine it with a couple of rounds of oligophysique, assign the barcodes, and now you know that this particular region here and that particular region here corresponds to the QR3 props in the chromosome at high resolution. And now you can even look inside what is the actual shape in 3D of each one of these things. You can also design it in a way that you target your favorite genes. Let's imagine you work on pluripotency genes and you want to understand what, where they go during a, a differentiation, for example, or transdifferentiation. You can target all those genes at once and still get from most cells more than 70% of the site's color and localized in space. You don't do chromosome tracing here. You just want to see whether they come together or not in a particular process. And finally, you can combine this with protein immunofluorescence in the same images. So you will get the tracing plus proteins of interest that you might have. So let me finish here by indicating that again, oligophysic is a set of technologies for in situ genome mapping. It's highly versatile as it was oligo storm can be used in many settings from wide field to super resolution if you pipeline it to super resolution. And it gives you a lot of data that then people like myself or our lab plays with. And who play with this data is this bunch of guys, it's uh, great guys from the lab. The work that I have mentioned to you specifically today is from David because we focus today in imaging and David is our imaging guy together with Irene. Irene is not anymore in our lab. In fact, now is with Tim Wu, uh, working with Tim Wu. She left our lab in the middle of the pandemic, unfortunately. These are the rest of the guys in the lab, and these are the people who pays the bills. And that's a beautiful collaboration we have with Ting Wu and her lab. Now, let me give me a couple of minutes. As I mentioned to you, this is uh, I, I am the chair of this uh, International Nuclear Consortium. And I don't want to leave without telling you what this is. This is a cluster conglomerate of different countries, not only in Europe, these are in Europe, but also in associated countries to Europe, such as these ones, including uh, Japan, Russia, and, and USA, as what we call international partners. The idea of the network is to increase the interactions between us. Unfortunately, COVID is not helping us. That's one of the reasons why we started the, the Inc. Academy. And fortunately, COST allowed us to do this because uh, one of the goals of COST is to bring people together in, in, in physical form. And they have been struggling also with the COVID, so they have allowed us to use the money for inventive uh, ideas such as the Inc. Academy. You can learn a bit more in, in our uh, URLs and in our uh, internet and Twitter accounts. This is all funded by H2020 through the COST. 
And again, it was initiated by Kirsten Vizchiki, and now it's chaired by myself with the vice chair um, being Anna Pombo in Germany. If you are not in, the, in any of these countries, uh, contact me. We can try to figure out how to include your country in the network. If you are in any of these countries, contact us and tell us what you want to do, because there is plenty of things that you can do within the network, and we have, to a certain extent, um, money to do this, these interactions. I don't want to finish without thanking very much the people who is behind the Inc. Academy uh, uh, idea. I just chair, which means normally that you, I, you don't do anything, but other people do. And in this case, it's not me who did the work. This is all these people is in the Inc. Academy, and especially Sara, Jonas, and Vladimir, who are bringing this into our reality today. Thank you very much. Thank you.